Surprise! I don't know why I'm telling you surprise because I haven't told you my surprise yet. Now I'm having my obligatory two weeks off and as usual I'll be filling the Flat Earth Friday and Tin Foil Tuesday slots with guest creators. And I think you'll be very pleased with the first one. He has absolutely smashed his way into the Flat Earth debunking scene. It is none other than Mr. Dave McKeegan. And if you don't know who he is yet, you'll wonder why you've never watched him before. And for today, Dave will be looking at our old friend Level Earth Observer and his views on the Space Shuttle. A great start. Let's roll the intro and it's over to you, Dave. everyone hope you're all doing well and welcome to flat earth friday a big thank you to simon dan for inviting us along uh, for those who aren't familiar with us i'm dave mckeegan and this is my sidekick rusty although if we're being honest he's probably the reason that most people actually watch my videos recently i was watching one of creaky blinders videos who was looking at level earth observer trying to argue that the space shuttle was completely fake now, obviously, Flat Earthers kind of have to say that the shuttle was fake, kind of by default, along with everything else space-related. Otherwise, the views from them rather put a damper on the whole Flat Earth idea. But Elio's claims were so bewildering that I just felt I had to address them. He begins with a claim that the shuttle must have been fake because of the SR-71 Blackbird. This is the space shuttle, and it's pure fantasy. Top speed, supposedly 17,500 miles an hour. Top temperature, 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Here's the SR-71. This is reality. Top speed, 2,200 miles an hour. Top temperature, 900 degrees Fahrenheit. The speed and temperatures of the SR-71 aren't remotely linked to the shuttle because they were completely different concepts. The SR-71 Blackbird was a high-speed spy plane. It took off from a runway and climbed using its own power of two Pratt & Whitney turbojets along with its wings generating lift. Now, wings need air flowing over them to do that, and the higher you go, then the less air there is. So you then have to travel faster in order to generate the same amount of lift, except that requires more thrust but jet engines need air to produce power, and you then have less of it up there. Eventually, all planes hit an equilibrium where their lift and thrust are equally matched against the weight and drag of air resistance, which for the SR-71 was about 2,500 miles an hour and 85,000 feet up. The temperatures it reached were from the drag whilst it was trying to remain as streamlined as possible. It was trying to avoid the drag, the shuttle, by comparison, actively wanted drag to slow it down. Space has no air resistance to stop a craft accelerating. Even with a small constant thrust, the longer the engine runs, the faster you go. The buildup of heat that the shuttle encountered wasn't whilst cruising like the SR-71, but was instead from re-entering the atmosphere, because it had a very raised angle of attack, intentionally causing drag to help slow it down from such high speed. Now, if the space shuttle was just titanium like the SR-71, then it would have melted. So, it was fitted with specially designed insulation tiles to protect it from such high temperatures. Most notably, the black ones on the underside, which were the ones that bore the brunt of air resistance on the way down. Ironically, those black tiles were called LI-900s, and they were developed and made by Lockheed, the very same Lockheed that built the SR-71. Its design looks more like a Lego aeroplane than some badass spacecraft. And then when you compare it to reality, and of course the speeds and the temperatures... By Elio's logic, the Thrust SSC looks even sleeker than an SR-71, and yet that thing could only travel at 763 miles an hour and reached only 300 degrees C. So therefore the SR-71 must be fake, right? One is clearly reality and has been verified many times. The other is just pure fantasy. This is just a plane that comes into land. It's not any spacecraft coming from an orbit around a ball. 
I'm not entirely sure how he's arguing the SR-71 was verified reality and yet the space shuttle somehow isn't, when we can see them both. Thousands of people over the years that the shuttle was active would go and witness the launch. The thing was literally bolted to rockets and shot up in the air, and it wasn't exactly going slow. There were several videos taken from people who were on commercial aircraft near Florida at the time that the shuttles were launched, who filmed the thing going straight up well beyond 30,000 feet that they were at, and at a hell of a rate of knots. Not only that, but many amateur spotters would sight the shuttles coming back down weeks later at the end of the mission. There's that well-known footage of Columbia breaking up on re-entry, which was actually captured by members of the public in Texas. People across pretty much the entire width of the US could witness the shuttles re-entering. People on the west coast could see it begin to re-enter less than 15 minutes before people 2,000 miles away on the east coast could see it coming into land. That's something flying multiple times faster than an SR-71. I mean, did they publicly launch the shuttle and then secretly land it somewhere, and then a few weeks later secretly launch it without anybody actually noticing the huge rocket trail so that they could publicly bring it into land? Next he tries bringing up the U-2 spy plane. Now whenever the space shuttle landed it was always accompanied by jets to help it land because the guys in the space shuttles were wearing space suits so the chase plane was helping the guys land. Now as we know the pilots of the U-2 spy plane wear space suits but they use a, sh uh, a chase car which of course, as you can see, is below the plane and has a brilliant view and can talk the pilot down easily. Now, I would have potentially believed the official narrative regarding the chase plane in the space shuttle if it wasn't for the U-2 plane. Now, this seems another completely unrelated comparison. From the reading up that I've done on this, it seems that the use of chase cars and planes had nothing to do with the pilots wearing pressure suits. SR-71 pilots also wore pressure suits because that thing could fly even higher than a U-2, but you'd never see them with a chase vehicle. The U-2 would often fly up to 12 hours at a time. That, that's 12 hours for pilots stuck in a tiny cockpit, unable to move, so by the time they'd, they'd come into land, they were mentally and physically exhausted. Add to that the U-2's cockpit didn't have great visibility, and it was landing on only two wheels, which were both in the center line of the plane. So in that instance, the chaser was actually there to help guide the pilot down on the runway, which you can even hear on the videos from inside the chase car. Two, two feet, tail slightly up at two, one, one inches. The shuttle, however, the pilots weren't exhausted. Touchdown was only an hour after they'd done the initial deorbit burn and 30 minutes after they'd first hit the atmosphere and the visibility from inside the shuttle's cockpit was perfectly fine. There seems to be no mention anywhere of the chase planes being used for the purpose of actually guiding the pilot down onto the ground. In fact, if you look at most of the onboards of the shuttle landings, they approach at such a steep angle that the runway pretty much fills the window, and even when they lift the nose up to come into land, the runway still is visible. The chase planes seem to have only been used in the early shuttle flights when they were testing it. You never saw any of the later flights coming in with chase planes, and they seem to have been there for the purpose of external inspections to make sure that there was no damage from re-entry or any other major concerns. The use of the car for the U-2 made sense because it was actually guiding the plane down onto the runway. Plus, with the U-2 being a very good glider, its landing speed was pretty slow at only around 120 miles an hour. The landing speed of the shuttle by comparison was more than double that, so no car could keep up with it anyway. And the use of the chase plane also allowed them to make sure that there was no other aircraft in the area which could potentially interfere with the landing, given that the shuttle didn't have any engines to continue flying if there was a problem. A point which LEO tries to contest. So you've got the jet planes coming in with the space shuttle, helping it to land, rather than the chase car, which of course makes far more sense being underneath the aircraft that's landing. But like I say, the space shuttle needs the planes to come in rather than the car, 
so you don't hear its engines come in. Like I say, it's a plane that flies in from an undisclosed location. They come in, turn the engine off just before they land, and they land. His claims that the space shuttle is just a jet plane, though, has a few flaws. Firstly, he's arguing that the purpose of the chase planes is to mask the sound of the jet engines from the shuttle. But as we've just covered, only the early shuttle flights had chase planes. The later ones didn't, so where's the sound of the jet engines there? Also, jet engines need ample airflow in order to work, so all jet planes have large intakes at the front to feed the engine. The shuttle has no such openings anywhere on its body to be able to allow a jet engine to work. The closest it has is three small holes on the nose, which are nowhere near large enough to get a sufficient airflow for a jet engine big enough to keep that thing flying. Then finally, Elio delves into the pit of ridiculous by bringing up the Challenger disaster. Today I'm going to be looking at some of the claims made regarding the Challenger 86 disaster. That is, some of the astronauts are supposedly still alive to this day and that they weren't on the actual space shuttle that blew up. And one of the characters is a lady called Judith Resnick. We've got that Judith Resnick NASA astronaut here on our screen. And there's some claims made that Yale professor Judith Resnick is the very same person. Now, he is not the first person that I have seen make the suggestion that the Challenger crew are all still alive and well, using comparisons of people with the same name who happen to look similar 20 years on. Now, this is a fairly recent image of Judith Resnick, Yale professor. So let's just have a look as these two images are blended together. Obviously, there's a good couple of, well, it's probably over 20 years time difference between the two images. But there is a definite similarity there. There's a hell of a lot of similarities. So I've got an ask. Is that you, Judith? Astronaut Judith Resnick graduated the University of Maryland in 1977 with a PhD in electrical engineering, then was selected by NASA as an engineer in 1978. She first flew on ST-41D in 1983, before tragically dying on board Challenger in 1986. Professor Judith Resnick graduated NYU School of Law in 1975, became a lecturer of Yale in 1976, and here she is speaking at the Supreme Court regarding the Bork nomination in 1987, barely 18 months after the Challenger perished. Now, if this is the same Judith Resnick, then, well, that's quite a feat to be able to hold down a full-time post as a lecturer of law whilst simultaneously completing a doctorate of engineering at a different university 300 miles away. Although I am surprised that nobody at Yale University noticed that their law professor was moonlighting as an electrical engineer on the space shuttle. The idea that they faked the Challenger is not only utterly bizarre, but personally, I think is completely heartless. I presume they're suggesting that the shuttles never really launched with people inside them, so when Challenger blew up, they had to pretend the crew had died, and so the crew knew they had to become new people and start new lives. For starters, if the shuttles had no crew in them at launch, who landed them afterwards? Secondly, if NASA were faking it, what the hell would possess them to have a nationwide competition to bring a civilian along for the fake show? And to choose as the first citizen passenger in the history of our space program, one of America's finest, a teacher. Tens of thousands of people entered for the opportunity to fly on board that Challenger flight. Do people seriously think that Krista McAuliffe went through the entire selection process, then months of training, for a space flight she knew she was never actually going to take. All the while with the possibility knowing if something went wrong, she would have to leave behind her husband, two kids, as well as all the students she taught in New Hampshire. Not only Krista and Judith, but the rest of the crew as well. Their families were all at the launch, seeing it in person. Their friends would have probably been watching it on TV. Is Elio seriously thinking that the crew would knowingly put their loved ones through the heartache of believing that they died, all for the cause of faking a space shuttle? 
And even if all that were happening, surely the last thing that NASA would do is take unnecessary risks that could expose it all, such as insisting on proceeding with the most watched shuttle launch ever, despite having Morton Thiokol, who made the solid rocket boosters, warning NASA not to launch because the temperatures were too cold. Why even fake a space shuttle and not have a method of crew escape? Like, why wouldn't NASA think, hmm, best to have a plausible way that we can keep the crew alive rather than having to go down the road of faking their deaths and keeping it hidden for decades by keeping the same basic physical appearance and letting them use exactly the same name? And of course, Challenger wasn't even the only shuttle lost. As mentioned before, there was the Columbia, which broke apart on re-entry in 2003. Now that put debris across hundreds of miles of Texas. People on the ground were finding bits of shuttle, helmets, mission insignias, and, and even body parts. Again, for what? The investigation into Columbia found NASA openly admitting they knew about the foam strike after they reviewed the launch footage the next day. Some analysts had requested military satellites be used to photograph the shuttle in orbit to check the extent of the damage, but NASA's upper management rejected the call because they didn't see a cause for concern. The investigation also highlights that had NASA done that surveillance and known the level of damage, the crew could have likely have been saved in a rescue mission because they had Atlantis being prepared for a launch a few weeks later. So why wouldn't NASA just say, great news, we've managed to get Atlantis launched and they've managed to rescue the Columbia crew, rather than faking yet more astronauts' deaths so publicly? I mean, both Challenger and Columbia had very public inquiries that brought huge negativity against NASA. What would possess them to proactively try and destroy themselves whilst trying to keep this huge conspiracy hidden from the world? Why would they not just put the failures down to aspects completely out of their control? Like, they could have put Columbia down to a piece of meteorite or something damaging the shuttle in orbit, but that nobody knew about it at the time. People think a spacecraft being able to fly 17,000 miles an hour in a vacuum doesn't make sense, yet the same people seem to think this whole let's fake two shuttle disasters for absolutely no reason makes perfect sense. Well, that is going to draw this video to a close. Thanks once again to Simon Dan for inviting us here. Hopefully you've enjoyed it, and if you have, then please consider heading over to our channel and subscribing, and hopefully we'll see you there.